Hello, everybody. We're ready to start. Um, good evening and uh, welcome to the 2019 edition of JetBrains Night Tel Aviv. My name is Oded Grober. I'll be emceeing the event tonight, and I'm very happy to be here again this year following our very successful and productive evening last year. Uh, it's great to see everyone who has uh, come out uh, eager to learn more about the tools JetBrains is offering and of course meet your fellow developers, do some networking, also have a drink, grab a bite, hope you enjoyed it. Um, tonight is a wonderful opportunity to have the JetBrains team here directly from you, uh, your thoughts about their products. Also, the JetBrains local platinum distributor, Software Sources, they're here to assist with any licensing question, provide support, serve as your local point of contact. Uh, there will be time for Q&A with each of the presenters, so if you've got something to say, please don't be shy about it. Um, now it's time to start learning something new straight from St. Petersburg. I'm pleased to invite Anastasia Kazakova, Product Marketing Manager, C++ Tools at JetBrains, for a talk titled Debug C++ Without Running. Please welcome Anastasia. And Anastasia will begin with a short video. Take it away. So, hello from the whole JetBrains tonight. Thank you all for coming. We're really great, and it's really great feeling to be here and to talk to you. So, uh, thank you for presenting me. So, my name is Anastasia Kazakova. I'm from St. Petersburg, from Russia. So, you can talk to me English or Russian. Sorry, I don't know other languages. Um, I'm a C++ product marketing manager in JetBrains, but we'll talk here about some hardcore C++, mostly because I'm a C++ developer. I spent eight years in embedded development before JetBrains. So we'll start with a talk not particularly on our tools. We'll do that in the end. There will be a separate presentation on C-Line. But right now, I'm going to talk about some general C++ experience. So I will be showing here several tools, including JetBrains, for sure, because we're a part of the ecosystem, but others as well. And we'll talk on C++ here. Um, yeah, so let's see yeah, if it works. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the talk is called, like, Debug C++ Without Running. And there the title is Fruitful Reading of the C++ Code. 
To be honest, I won't teach you how to write the readable code. That's kind of a complicated task. Let's do something simpler. Let's learn how to read the code. That's what actually we as developers do most of the time. Like most of the time, we're not writing the code, we're reading the code. And reading C++ code could be tricky. Uh, just before we start, how many of you actually do some C++ development? Cool, hey. <laughs> Uh, if you don't do C++, don't worry. You'll learn amazing things about this language. Probably after that, you'll start using C++, or maybe you'll try to keep yourself away from it as long as possible. Um, we'll start with some nice picture, which actually shows the distribution of the C++ developers for the C++ standards. This is collected from JetBrains Developer Ecosystem Survey, we run yearly for three years in a row already, 2017, 18, and 19 is not yet published, but you still see some, can see some data here. The green one is for 2019, the blue one is for 2018, and I'm actually showing this picture to uh, put your attention to this column here. You know what's that? C++ 11, how long time ago that year was? You probably guess. So we have C++ 14 and C++ 17 already. C++ 20 is nearly finished. The last meeting of the program committee, like the language committee, will be in uh, Cologne in summer. And then the like C++ 20 is closed for the added new features. But here I would like to emphasize one thing. People are still using C++ 11 and pre-C++ 11 things. There are reasons for that. Dozens of reasons. If you're interested, the week before at Core C++ conference in Tel Aviv, I did a talk about the reasoning behind that. I won't dig into the reasoning here that much. What I want here is to talk about like, how to do that, how to deal with that, what to do. Uh, so one more picture here to understand the problem is that was the question from the same developer ecosystem survey. Uh, and we asked, if you plan to upgrade to a new standard in the upcoming six months. So uh, that's the distribution of the answers. Uh, naturally, people on C++ 17, they're not planning to upgrade anywhere because we didn't have the C++ 20 options in the survey. Uh, if you're closer to like C++ 17, you probably want to upgrade more. Uh, but in general, quite many people don't play plan to upgrade. They still stay on all the standards, or they maybe plan to upgrade to C++ 11, which you can see in yellow on the picture. Um, yeah, that's how we do in the C++ world. Another survey run by the C++ Foundation, that's actually the whole foundation that own in the language, the uh, pr uh, language committee, and actually doing an amazing job and they collected a, f a survey in 2018. And yeah, so some very similar results in terms of the standards distribution. So green one is pretty much all the features are allowed. Blue is just a few features from the standard are allowed in my company. And yellow is nothing is allowed for the particular standard. So naturally, like C++ um, 98, mostly allowed, like it also like fine with C++ 11, but if we come to C++ 17, it mostly like not allowed at all. That was the situation for a year ago. And also this cloud is very important. That was the, uh, those who filled the survey, they actually filled their feelings about the adoption of the new standard and the language in general. And you can see there are some interesting words like difficulty, difficult to understand, um, so yeah, all this like hard to understand. The ceiling which we usually have when we do some C++ development. I think you know what, what I'm talking here about if you do a C++. But let's dig a little bit deep, deeper into that. Before that, a couple of uh, more graphs to show you here. When we talk about the adoption of the new standard, there are two important techniques which we have to keep in mind. Unit testing and static analysis. Because if we move to a new standard, we have somehow to check that we haven't broken anything. So either with the unit testing or with the static analysis. Unit testing, interesting statistics. How many of you actually do use the unit testing framework? Raise your hand. Cool, you're a cool group, but 
can you see how many people are not using anything here? So here you can see like that much. So it's like last year it was nearly like this year, sorry, it was like 25% not using any unit testing framework at all. You know, uh, in April I was at the conference and there was a very nice professor from some Scandinavian university, I don't remember his name and the exact country. He's teaching embedded development in C++. And he told me a very nice thing, like, my goal is to teach the students in the way that in 10 years I'm not afraid that my children are actually flying in an airplane. Um, yeah, interesting story with unit testing in, like, uh, in that sense. So, yeah, is it better with the static analysis? Like, a little bit. Again, 30% using nothing, but 42% here, uh, relying on their tools, IDs. That actually makes us think that we have some responsibilities. So we have to provide some tools for static analysis because the people are relying on them. They're not using some external tools. So yeah, but that's good to know that people at least use what we're providing the tools. Um, let's talk about the C++. How you usually feel about the C++? Think now about one word describing your feeling about the C++ language. Just one word, put it in one word for yourself. Okay, got it? Um, I've collected a couple of opinions from the people I talked to. So uh, once a, uh, actually a person came to our booth at ACCU conference, it was a year ago, and he told me like, yeah, but the C++ developers, they should suffer. I was like, probably yes, because when we do suffer, we become more attentive to what we code. Uh, maybe that will keep us from some bugs. But should we really suffer? Maybe something could help us, maybe the tools. Um, there was a nice thread, we'll come to it in a minute. Uh, I call it ranging on ranges. So it actually started with the Eric Nibbler posted a blog post on the rangers coming to the C++20 standard. And there was some nice command like Sean Parent uh, from Adobe, uh, we actually commanded about the C++ as a cognitive overhead. Have any one of you heard of that word when we're thinking about the C++? Okay, it's quite many people do. Uh, also, the, some people say that like, yeah, we need some naive and simple debuggable code, and C++ is not like that. And it actually, you can all sum up all of these things by Herb Sutter, who actually now struggles in the committee for at the same time, more powerful, but simpler C++. And yeah, I talked about ranging on ranges. Um, if you don't know the whole story, uh, ranges, uh, ranges v3, v3 library will enter the standard uh, for seven, uh, C++ 20. Uh, Eric Nibbler, the author uh, of the library, he actually published a blog post uh, explaining um, what actually was uh, added to the standard, what are the features. He was using kind of unsuccessful example with uh, Pythagorean triples, and the code was really hard to read. It showed the power of the feature naturally, but the example was kind of hard. And then a guy from Unity, this uh, guy called Aris, actually entered the discussion, and he actually posted another blog post explaining why this is an awful story, why you shouldn't do that to C++. And like he said that like these features, they look terrifying to him because he doesn't know how to, how to work with this code. And then like a huge discussion started. You know these Twitter threads that are usually like several hundreds of messages long. Quite interesting thing to read. Uh, I just uh, took a few from this thread um, like the one is saying that C++ is changing uh, in a very scary way. And the people were asking like, how would you want to debug that? And some uh, people were saying that actually the main issue of C++ is that there are 10 ways of doing one thing. Just to illustrate, if you don't know, uh, or if you're not a C++ person, there are two talks on C++ initialization done by uh, Nico Gesitis uh, at CppCon and Tima Dumler, who did that for Meeting C++ and actually Core C++ conference a week ago as well. Um, look here, do you know what's that? That's like 
several ways of initializing the integer in C++, like just a few. And there are like a couple of slides for initializing more complicated objects. And that's the story behind the C++. When we have something that we need to use, we can do that in many ways. Some ways are nicer, some ways are more readable, some days are not, but still they, are all, they all exist. That's the power of the language and that's the price we actually pay for it. Uh, just let's start with some actual examples. This is an example we actually got from our QA engineering C-Line team. How we work in the QA engineering team, we have automatic unit tests, uh, we have automatic regression tests, all kind of tests running. But we also have like real people, QA engineers, sitting and playing with the tool. They're doing the smoke tests, and regression tests, uh, like manually, and they play with some interesting examples. So they just create some pieces of C++ code and check how the IDE actually behaves on them. So they came up with some nice example of variable template. The IDE failed. They actually reported the bug to the developers. The developer responsible for the feature uh, was a little bit surprised. His first question was, what this code is actually doing? There was no reply, like that's a valid code, you can compile it. We say, okay, what do you do when you don't know what the code is doing? First thing in C++, you put it to Compiler Explorer, naturally, like you try to see what's actually happening behind this code. We did that, didn't add many new information to us, like okay, doing something, adding some Fogarty 2. Um, okay, let's simplify it. So what we did, we actually, um, use the a little bit different syntax for uh, templates, uh, for variable templates. Then we remove them completely, and then we actually remove the cast. What do we end up with? Return 42. So this whole code piece in the beginning, it just simply returns 42. That's the complete equivalent. That's the same. This is more than C++ ways of doing things. Okay, another problem with the C++, what do we actually inherit? You know that word? No one, macros, come on. <laughs> so we have macros in the language, we can't like avoid them still. What's the problem with the macro? Here I have some nice macro called X, and actually even a more nicer like X macro txt file with some lines of code, not a valid C++, just a text file. And my X macro is doing some magic inside, so it's actually trying to define a enum uh, with some values there. And then I undefined the macro. After I actually did that, all the traces are removed of all that happened there, so no one knows now. So I just have some new types, some new enumeration. And it has some values, and I need to guess them somehow. Uh, I have no idea how to guess it, just if I don't like look through all this macro definition, if I go into this X macro txt file and try to preprocess it in my head, or I can just do some preprocessing and maybe run the code, yeah, then I can learn something from the code. But the problem is it's kind of difficult to get all the cases without like preprocessing or running the code or trying to at least preprocess in your head. Okay, one more. Uh, creepy macro example. I have a class uh, with some like function member, and somewhere in my code, I I'm using this macro class def, and it defines a class for me like class A, class B, and class C. And if the macro definition is in some other file, when I'm looking at the class that I actually got, I have no idea how it actually looks inside. What's there? What are the function members there? What else, it, what else it actually has inside? So how could I get this information without running a preprocessor? Could I just look at the code and understand it somehow? Uh, probably we can, but wait. One more interesting example, which I like the most. Uh, context is a very important thing to C++. In C++, actually, the biggest issue in comparison to other languages is at every moment of your life, to understand what is under the carrot, a type or not a type. And if you look here, like um, X is either, like that line is either a template instantiation or an expression. 
and it depends on the magic, this, this nice value which I'm using like in the preprocessor branches. So I'm defining like either a template, uh, templated structure, or I define just an integer x equal to 100. So that line in the function test, it's actually either an association or an expression. And there is some very important difference between like using a template or just writing an expression. I want to understand that when I read my code, what I'm actually doing that. And it's not that easy because that magic could be a compilation option. It could be environment variable. It could be whatever. It could be taken from somewhere outside from the environment where I actually build it. It could be platform dependent. So to understand what's actually going on there, I have to somehow collect all these like creepy flags and then do this in my head or at least run the code for the proper platform. And what if I don't have this platform? I have to do some, this thing in my imagination. Uh, overloads. Function overloads in C++ are from one point are very simple. There is a very straightforward algorithm written down in the standard. You collect all the candidates, you throw away all the things that doesn't fit the candidate set, and then you select one and check all the privacy specifiers. Easy, yeah? Anyone could quickly guess what will be printed uh, in that case. I will be looking at your face and look how you calculate the overload resolution in your head. I like that moment of my dog. <laughs> Calculated? Are you quick enough yet? Yeah, two and two. If I use 1.0 in the second case, will be two and nine. You know, kind of easy. A very straightforward algorithm. But what's the problem? Like, you may have all these function uh, definitions, declarations, you like spread across your whole project. You don't know where are they, how they are dependent on the compilation flags, how this actual candidate set is built. And doing this is your, in your head, it could take time. Uh, do you know that like those who are not from C++, now you learn a nice thing about C++, we can overload operators. In C++ code, when you look at a plus, you never know. Is it a plus or is it doing something else? The most probably overloaded operator is the stream output. Here in the example, yeah, that line, half of the stream output operators are taken from std library. Half of them uh, are actually my overloaded operators for stream output. They look the same on your screen, yeah? But they are different. So there is a power, but it comes with some price and some responsibilities. And we actually came to the pike, meta classes. If you've heard about the Herb Sarah's proposal, what we're gonna probably have sometime in the future in C++. We have this interface, yeah, where is it? Yeah, here, on top. We have some meta class on the left, and it's maybe somewhere in the standard library or somewhere, I don't know, in some other file. And after the compiler pass, after the compilation, I actually got my struct shape. A nice way of adding new, uh, new type of types to C++, like we have like classes and struts, but maybe we need to generate some other things, like to use some interfaces. But how could I actually guess, looking at the interface shape, which struct I actually get in the very end? Can someone help me in the whole world? That would be a nice thing. And Herb actually called these things professional hiders. These are professional hiders in the language. All these macros, all these overloads, all these meta classes, they are. Okay, you may say, like, you can run and debug your code, you can run the static analysis, uh, there are so many things you can do, maybe that could help me. But wait, compilation could take quite long, and sometimes it includes a deploy to run something, and something the target platform is different from what you have right now. And maybe you even have an incomplete code. You just have a code of a library. Do you really, to understand the library, need to create a sample using this code? Or maybe you can just go something and try something different. Static analysis is very good, but it's not always showing you the flow in logic. It tries to show you like the compilation issues and some like maybe more profound issues, but not the flow in your logic, in your business logic. You'll never get to, uh, this from the static analysis. 
And maybe you're just not searching for the box, you're just trying to understand the code. You're just reading the code base and trying to understand what it's actually doing. Um, like this whole talk started with the Herb notes, uh, Herb keynotes at CppCon, Firds on Generative C++, and there are three main Firds that I actually took from it, like language abstractions are hiders, abstractions need tooling support, and the best thing, good abstractions need to be toolable, because if they're not, the vendor or the tools are actually really suffering with getting the things done and trying to help you. And Herb actually started with this nice slide, which I treat as a features, feature list. So like all the features like he likes from different standards with how he would like to debug them. Okay, help C++ to be debuggable. Is it actually possible? Yeah, it is. So I would say there are like some good tools in the ecosystem which actually help with at least part of the task. So the first uh, one will be looking at the macro debug, which is understanding the substitution before running the code, before compiling the code, and even before running the preprocessor step on the code. So we just read it and try to understand. Uh, like I will be marking the tools which I'm showing here with this icon so that you can actually guess from which tool the feature is coming. So uh, in C line, we implemented a thing called quick documentation, which shows the final replacement for the macro. So here, you can actually see the uh, final replacement for the what will be actually substituted after the preprocessor pass on class dev, and it substitutes all the nested macro calls. So you can actually see the most useful case is probably looking at the boost macros in quick documentation. If you've ever done that, I recommend you to try that. You'll get this long list of lines, and that's the actual substitution for like most of the huge nested boost macros. In Resharper C++, we decided to implement a little bit different approach. We decided to do a real debug process. We actually do this thing that is called substitute next step. So you can substitute the just the next step of this macro. You can go step by step, like in some sense unwinding this stack of macros. And you can stop, stop at any point, at the point where like you think, okay, now I understand what's going on further. I can stop here, like undo or whatever. And naturally, you can just say, okay, now substitute all the steps for me. The same result as the showing the final substitution, the quick documentation, but just happens in, in the editor itself. Um, I would say be very careful. There might be some context, context issues. I will talk about them in a couple of slides. Now just some more practical example of this debugging of the macro. Boost PP repeat. I would like to understand what it's actually doing. What I have here, uh, one step substituted and then, yeah, just all the steps substituted. So I can go using both paths, like step by step or just substitute all the steps and I can see what actually will be there after the preprocessor run. And I think to understand the boost. As I said, be very careful with the context. Why? There are these nice macros we have, like counter and line. Uh, you probably know the line just returns the number of the line and the counter just an increasing counter. Um, let's say I have this new var macro and I call, the, uh, call it like three times and I will substitute the second call. I'll get this uh, v1 variable and an ID will show me some red squiggles. You know why? because there is now some duplicated uh, declaration. Because the counter for the, this, it was the third call, now it's the second call of the new var, so the counter there is actually like one, it starts from zero, zero, then one, so it will be the same line. So when you substitute in something, you might affect the context. So with that, you have to be very careful when you use these things. Um, in other macro issues, like, let's assume we have this sample, and I will go to this definition of the funcam, we'll go to the func symbol, and we'll try to navigate to the declaration. Do you know how many of the usage cases will be mostly showing by the most, nearly all the uh, C++ IDs in the market? They will show you this. Two out of actual three. They won't count 
this last one. Because it's very complicated search. You have to search for the whole code base for just looking for a symbol and mostly the IDs just say like, okay, that's enough just to stop here. That will skip. So yeah, macros are interesting thing. Let's now try to debug the type information. Um, so we need to understand the final type and that's actually the easiest part because all the IDs doing C++, they build the whole AST tree. They actually know the type. So they just need to show it to me. Some nice piece of C++ code. Modern C++, we can avoid types at all. Uh, we can just use duckle type outer and we're fine with that. The type will be automatically inferred. Uh, like here it will be double because I'm passing the double argument, 3.0. And quite a good situation here. If you take all major C++ IDs, they will all infer it for you successfully like C-Line, Eclipse, Visual Studio, like Rich Harbor, C++, the same. So they all show double to you because they all have it in a state tree. Okay. Uh, in Rich Harbor, C++, we decided like, okay, we can debug macro step by step. Let's debug type step by step. So we just added the substitute type def through one step. And this is a nice example of boost MPL. If I would like to understand what it's actually doing, I can say, okay, substitute one step to me. And then like after like a few substitution, I will get this D high in the very end. Or I can substitute again all the type devs in just one action. Uh, that again looks like some proper debugging process, but without actually debugging your application. Templates. How you can debug the templates? Uh, Instantiations, like usually the tools are showing you the actual function signature and how the types were substituted to the template parameters. So usually when you call some like quick documentation in case of Resharper C++ or just hover in Eclipse, you can see the actual function signature with some type substituted, sometimes some documentation comment before the signature. Civalop, which is uh, kind of a nice academic tool done by Switzerland students, does this nice chain of separate windows showing the instantiation process step by step. I have only one window here, but they can do several windows in the chain if there are several nested instantiation. Um, okay, the big question mark means I don't know the tool that actually can do that. What I want here is when I navigate from the get value usages down here, I would like in the definition the proper branch of the const expert to be highlighted for me. Which actual branch is used there? I don't know tools that are doing that now. I know that in the past, KDevelop actually did something very similar when you were navigating from the template association they were trying to show you the IntelliSense based on the type which was used in that particular instantiation. They unfortunately removed the feature after they moved to the Clang-based uh, Clang engine. So, but that would be nice to have. But the question mark means I don't know uh, any tool doing that right now. But a very good feature from temp uh, template called Template IntelliSense in Visual Studio this is the version I still haven't tried because they announced the feature a year ago and it was just allowing you to provide the type which you'll be using to instantiate the template and then in the template body you can use, for example, the completion based on that type. Recently on build they announced that they will show you the list of all the available instantiations because, come on, they know it. They build the whole AST. They don't need to ask me about the type. They know all these types. So they will be showing all the instantiation and also they will be like, suggesting you add all existing instantiations. That's actually what I need. I'm using a template. To implement a body, I just want to add all the instantiations I'm using. Or I, for example, know which type I'll be mostly using. I can add it on my own. Good thing. Uh, that feature I called reactive template IntelliSense. What I call proactive is what we do in Resharper C++. Uh, when you have a, uh, default types for your template types, we're actually doing this completion and quick documentation pop up. Uh, we force them to use this information so the completion is based on the default type provided to the template. Okay. Can we debug the function and operator overloads? Would be nice to do this somehow. We can do some debug in C line for operator overloads. 
Actually, if you uh, put a carrot on an operator, like here in that example, it will highlight all the usages of the same operator. And you can see that in that line, like half of the usages was particularly highlighted. And also the, uh, like, yeah, my overloaded operator here was highlighted like that. So, and you can also do the find usages that will find the particular usages of this operator without the, all the overloaded cases. Um, okay, that is about the operator. Can we debug the overloaded functions? As I said, the function overload is a very straightforward process. It's just an algorithm. So how we can help users in the tool to guess this algorithm actually in their head. So most of the tools are actually uh, doing something like that, showing you the, like, the overload set, like the available combinations of, for example, parameters. Like Visual Studio allows you just to uh, switch through like, uh, all the, the whole set. In C-Line, we just show the whole set in one pop-up. Um, Eclipse and Resharper C++, they both show the whole function signature. And in Resharper C++, we also add a documentation for that so that you can actually uh, see the whole uh, overload set. Uh, another thing here is that the name hints might help. This is the feature we have in Resharper C++ and currently adding to C line. Like when you have a function call, uh, before the arguments, there is actually like some grayed out uh, name of the parameter so that you can actually guess what this actual argument stands for. And also like you can see that in Resharper C++, we shows you what actually was, for example, deleted from the candidate set. Like there is delete specifier used. So, okay, and when the overload fails, do we have some help from the tooling? There is a very natural thing like Clang, a perfect community tool, actually helps a lot because when you have some overload which actually failed, it shows you the particular reason for that. So we show it in like both FreeSharp, C++ and C line, and some other tooling doing that as well. Like for example, here it show like candidate template ignore, substitution failure, no member named method. So it tells you at least some reason, and the reason is like in C-Line we make it clickable so you can actually navigate to the, um, to the definition that called the, the issue. And we tried to do something very similar in Resharper C++, adding even more, more details to Clang errors. But that means that I can debug when the overload fails. What I don't know is how to debug if the overload succeeded. I can check the candidate set, but it would be really nice to see the reasons why the candidates actually didn't fit. I don't know tools who currently can do that. Explain it to me in some good way. So they only shows me usually the set, which is indeed part of the job. Then you can like calculate in your head. But yeah, unfortunately no one currently helps with like showing some reasons. We still think about that, if we can do that nicely. But no solutions here for now. There is some interesting uh, feature which could help, and it calls navigate to unmatched function. For example, assume you had a function. I will try to run the video. I'm not sure it's actually quite good. Yes. So the story behind is that if you have, for example, a function declaration, and you update it, or a function definition, and you updated it somehow, not with the actual refactoring, which updates both declaration and definition and all the usages, but you just updated it manually. Um, would it be good still to navigate, like if you, for example, updated the definition to the proper declaration, but the regular action won't go there because the function signature uh, doesn't match. So, but this action going to unmatched signature, actually trying to use some heuristics and try to, to actually guess that probably, yeah, that was the same function. You maybe made a mistake or that's some very similar one. Uh, I know that that feature actually, uh, it exists in Resharper C++ and I saw some very similar behavior with the Qt creator go to action. Um, the last thing I'm gonna talk here is about includes. Like I can't talk about debugging C++ without talking about the includes. So there is a nice blog post written back in 2011 about Hitter Hero. There are just a group of people who actually implemented this nice tool. 
and they actually wrote a nice blog post where they calculated a blow-up factor. A blow-up factor is the total number of lines with all-inclusive lines after all-include substitution divided by the total number of lines in the project. Uh, you might guess, when you start a project, what usually happens? You, you have just maybe one or two includes you actually need. You know, because you just added them for some particular library. What happens further? You people are coming to the project, the team is growing, some people are just missing some information. Usually the people are not removing the includes. They are not that brave. They just keep, maybe someone needs that. I will just leave it. In a year, in two years, in five years, you have this long list of includes, and even the people try to refactor it, you know, they try to put them all into one big header, and like then include this header everywhere, so all this include disaster is actually hidden. And what's the worst thing which is actually coming out of that, you know? What happens? The compilation type just keep increasing. It just increases more and more until at some point you decide to actually find out what's going on there. So these uh, people who actually wrote the blog post, they implemented this header hero tool, uh, calculated the blow up factor and actually wrote the tool that can calculate it for your project and you can see that there you can build a list of files with this like biggest contribution to this total number of lines of code. Uh, we did nearly the same in ReSharp C++. We called it includes profiler, so we can build the list, and it's actually a hierarchical list of files included one into each other, and you can look at the first column, uh, actually fourth column, which is like contrib line contribution inclusive, so that's the number of lines with all the includes included, actually. And you can just, you know what you can do? Sort and look at the winner. <laughs> and try to do something with these winners on top. What you can actually do? Mostly the people do the, the one very obvious thing. They pack it to the pre-compiled header. This, this helps the compilation uh, time issue, but doesn't help a lot actually to, the, to clean in the project. So the better way will be to remove unused includes. Quite many tools nowadays can like grade out the include for you in the file and say like, hey, probably you don't need it. It's not used. And you can then maybe think or check and then remove. There is also that nice tool from Google called include what you use. Uh, it actually tries to analyze your project and to show you which headers are uh, unused and actually replace them with forward declarations sometimes or just suggest to remove them. Um, you know the nice number, the Google actually reported that the tool helped them to reduce the compilation speed by 30%. 30%, think about it. 30%, if your project is built for an hour, you can just cut 20 minutes. Yeah, sounds cool. Um, so include error is very similar to include what you use, it's bundled into Eclipse, so just very similar tool. But these tools are not, no magic, so there are still can do all the things for you. For include what you use on Google site, you can check this why include what you use is difficult page in their help because it really a kind of complicated task. It might fail in complicated cases. It might uh, give you some false positives. So you still have to like to do some uh, manual work. And yeah, before I finish, just a nice slide with all the links to what I mentioned here. So if you're interested in like any talk or any uh, st static data or whatever, you can like take a picture and go for this link. And that's it, thank you, use the tools. <laughs> Okay, I might take a few questions and we'll maybe switch to the next speaker and before the speaker is switching, I will take a few questions because it will take him time to switch. So where is our next speaker? Yeah, you will introduce, okay. Um, all right, uh, any questions for Anastasia? You were too clear, <laughs> too clear. Everything, I, I understood every, every word. Yeah, you still can come later. I'm here around and ask whatever you want. 